Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us here today on this Thursday, October 8, 2020. Uh, my name is Jeff Garris. I am the Outreach Director with the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center. Uh, among my tasks here are helping to coordinate our state budget advocacy uh, campaign, working with many of your organizations as allies, advocating for the kind of investments that we need to see here in Pennsylvania uh, to uh, improve Pennsylvania for all Pennsylvanians. Uh, I also work as a person coordinating something relatively new here, which is what we call our 99% Pennsylvania campaign. Uh, this is a, an exciting new campaign we're doing in conjunction with our national folks at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, uh, working with many of you to advocate for federal policies uh, here by putting pressure on and raising our voices for our members of Congress and our two senators to hear us. This, this year uh, has brought us sort of an interesting intersection of our work on federal issues and our work on the state budget. Uh, because of the pandemic, we are in a situation where a partial stopgap budget was passed uh, relatively early this year, before the start of the fiscal year, uh, which began on July 1st. It was only for five months for most of the budget. Mark's going to get into more of that later. Uh, but, you know, the day of reckoning is coming. Uh, the Most of the budget is only funded through the end of November. Part of the reason for that was because uh, the state has lost a considerable amount of revenue. Uh, due to the pandemic, with businesses being closed, people being out of work, not paying in income taxes. Uh, and so we and our state leaders were really hoping that the federal government was going to step in and provide additional ongoing relief for individuals who are struggling in Pennsylvania, but also uh, funding for our state government to be able to compensate for the tremendous loss of revenue. Uh, so here's where we are on that. If you've been watching the news, this has become a pretty big story in the last few weeks. Um, the House had a budget they passed very early back in May. Uh, the Senate didn't take any action. Finally, the Senate voted on a very small package early in September. Uh, it was clearly not a package that was designed to be a, a point of negotiation. But the Trump administration began negotiating uh, in earnest with the uh, Democrats in the uh, U.S. House of Representatives uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, it was not fast moving, but, you know, there were signs that uh, Republicans were beginning to move in the direction of where the Democrats were looking in terms of the amount of aid that we were going to be hoping to receive, uh, not just for our state government, but for our local governments, uh, for people who are out of work, for people who are struggling with uh, being unable to afford housing. Um, and there seemed to be some signs that some progress was being made. Strangely, a couple of weeks ago, um, Trump tweeted out of the blue that Republicans should move closer to where the Democrats were, which gave us some real hope that they might actually come to a negotiated compromise before the election. And that's critically important. You know, a lot of the focus is on the election right now. Uh, legislative members of Congress are back in their home districts campaigning for re-election. Um, and really, in order to have aid coming into Pennsylvania and other parts of the country before the end of this calendar year, they really needed to get this package enacted. Um, unfortunately, that took some big steps back this week. Uh, on Sunday from uh, the Walter Reed Hospital, President Trump tweeted uh, that uh, they should get moving and uh, get the relief package passed and enacted. Uh, again, keeping the pressure on, in particular, Republicans in the Senate to negotiate for a compromise package. Uh, but then, unfortunately, on Tuesday night, he went on a Twitter um, rampage and said that he was going to stop having people from the administration negotiating uh, with uh, Speaker Pelosi for a package. Uh, this has been met with widespread uh, disappointment. Many Republicans in both the House and the Senate have been calling on the president to please resume these negotiations. There's a lot at stake. There are a lot of people who are desperately hurting right now, months after a lot of the earlier relief packages uh, had expired. There are a lot of businesses that are very close to uh, going out of business. Business leaders have expressed their disappointment that negotiations have been halted. And um, the... Uh, Democrats, of course, have been uh, pointing to the fact that it was not them, it was not they, 
who broke off the negotiations. Uh, but we really need to get these negotiations going again. More recently, just the last day or so, the president has been saying that he uh, would like them to pass relief for uh, the airline industry, which may be a possibility. But he's also said he, he wants them to, instead of passing a comprehensive package, to give people $1,200 stimulus checks. And Speaker Pelosi has been pretty clear in saying, uh, you know, a few weeks before the election, we're not going to just pass a package that only sends out checks with Donald Trump's name on it, uh, that there's widespread relief and comprehensive relief that's needed. So unfortunately, right now, most people in D.C. are telling us that while it was still a long shot before this, it looks like we are probably not going to see any relief before the election. And many folks are saying it's going to be pretty unlikely that there will be any relief coming in the immediate aftermath of the election. Most likely, we're not going to see relief for individuals, for businesses, and for our state government until January, which brings us to our state budget. We are now in a very tricky place uh, with our state budget. This five-month stopgap budget that was put into place in the hopes that there would be federal aid, uh, now it appears that when we get to the end of November, something's going to need to be done, uh, and we're short several billion dollars in revenue. I'm not going to take any more of Mark Steer's thunder away. I'm really pleased to turn it over to the director of PBPC, Mark Steer. Mark, take it away. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you all for being here. I'm going to uh, start my slideshow and uh, share my screen. Um, come on, let's go. And uh, there's, this is always a little bit of a tricky process because I have three monitors that sit on my desk and I never know where where things are going to show up. So I got to make sure that I share the right screen and that I can still see you while I'm doing this. So this should be it. Okay, you all can see that. Yeah, Jeff, you can see the screen. Yes, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was on mute. Yes, we can see that. And okay, it appears cool. to be the right thing. It's about the budget. Good. All right. Well, that we're, we're, we're starting off okay then. Uh, I'm just going to fix one little other thing here. If I can. There. Okay. Um, here we go. So I'm actually going to talk about the budget, but I'm going to set it in the context of, of COVID-19 and the economic disaster we're facing because there, there are a bunch of things that I think we, we need to discuss if we're going to really understand the political circumstances and the economic circumstances and the budgetary circumstances we're now facing. Uh, so let me start with uh, the, the impact of COVID-19 on the economy. And first, here's just a look at uh, cases in, uh, in Pennsylvania. You can see the, the sharp uh, rise of cases from March through April, the slow decline through about the middle of June, then a second rise, and then we've been pretty static since then, ups and downs. There's a little bit of an upturn right now. Um, we have done much better than many other states in the country in that we haven't had a second sharp spike, but we also haven't totally gotten COVID-19 under control in, in, in this state. Um, we've done a lot of good. I'm going to talk a lot about Governor Wolf's business closure and stay-at-home orders, but the one thing we do know is it, it saved thousands of lives, maybe 15 to 20,000. We're going to be coming out with a paper, a revised, a blog post rather, next week that tries to do a better estimate of that. But, and it's kind of hard to do, but our original estimate was a little high than I, and then I, the revised estimate was about 10 to 15,000 lives saved through um, the end of April. And since then, uh, we've gotten some new information that suggests that we may have doubled that number of lives saved by the aggressive steps we've taken. Of course, as I'll point out, it's not just the aggressive steps that the governor's taken. It's the reaction of human beings to a very scary situation uh, and their decision to protect themselves. Um, turning to the economic circumstances, we know that GDP decline in the United States in the second quarter of 2020 was 9.5%. That's 31.7% on an annual basis. In Pennsylvania, uh, we don't really have detailed statistics, but from what we can tell from various uh, statistics we do have about unemployment, about consumer spending, 
Uh, Pennsylvania was slightly worse than the United States as a whole, but has been recovering and is about where the United States as a whole is right now. Uh, we are seeing a, a, an economic recovery, but it's a very spotty economic recovery. And we'll look, see some data in, about that in a minute. First of all, we're going to look at unemployment losses, which have been very severe for those with low incomes and in industries that primarily employ those with low incomes. Here's some data that shows um, uh, on a, a percent change in, and I have, I have something covering my screen so I can actually see this a lot. Yeah, percent changes in employment. Um, you see a very sharp drop uh, in the blue line, that's for everyone, uh, and a recovery, but we're still about 6% below where we were on January 20th. For those with high wages above $60,000 a year, um, employment is back to where it was on January 20th. For those with low wages, less than $27,000 a year, employment is still off about 14.6%. That's a very, very serious problem for people with low wages. And it's a serious problem for our economy as a whole, as we'll see. Um, here we're looking not uh, at, at um, uh, wages, but we're looking at different uh, industries. Um, and this data I, I'm presenting because it goes to a later date than the last set of data. Um, you can see for people in professional business services, employment is pretty much back to where it was. Total employment is down about 6% as of August 1st, maybe a little bit better by now. Um, uh, employment in the leisure and hospitality industry, restaurants, hotels, uh, airlines, things like that, uh, are down 23.8%. Uh, that's, of course, because people are not going on trips, they're not going out to dinner, they're not staying in hotels. And this is really important, um, both because it's a, a pretty big part of the economy in parts of Pennsylvania, but because it employs a lot of people, particularly a lot of people with low income. So the two employment charts really uh, pick up each other's uh, information. Uh, we're seeing really low, uh, uh, really high unemployment rates for people with low incomes in part because they're concentrated in industries that have been particularly hit by COVID-19 and the economic disaster it created. Um, the, the impact of COVID-19 has been very unequal in, with regard to race. And that's what we see here. If you look at the, the differential in the unemployment rate in first quarter, second quarter, by uh, race, you'll see that people of color, black and Hispanic people uh, have, have seen unemployment rise to much higher rates, uh, both in the United States and in Pennsylvania. And, and that's uh, you know, just one, one part of a picture that, that basically shows that um, people of color and have generally been harder hit by the COVID-19 epidemic in many ways. This is one of them they've been harder hit because they've been frontline workers and are more likely to come down with the disease and more likely to die from the disease. Um, we've seen a dramatic decline in partial recovery in, in consumer spending. Um, and I'm gonna turn right to that chart because there's something really interesting about it. If you look at consumer spending, you'll see that, um, that uh, through, the, almost the end of August, something very interesting. Total consumer spending dropped by about 40% as of April 1st. It's been gradually going up. That's that blue line in the middle. And by uh, early October, we're, spending has gone up since January 20th. And that's a sign of some real economic recovery. Don't forget, we would generally expect in a normal economy that consumer spending goes up quarter after quarter, year after year, because we have economic growth. So 1.9% increase from January 20th is far be is below what we would expect in an economy that was growing at its usual rate. Uh, but note that consumer spending for those with high incomes has dropped, dropped always dropped hot, faster than consumer spending for those with low incomes. And there are two stories here that are really important. One is that consumer spending for those with low incomes uh, recovered faster uh, despite higher unemployment rates for people with low incomes. And that was because of the, the federal uh, supplementary unemployment insurance, the additional $600 a week that uh, folks uh, who were unemployed were getting, which was boosting incomes for people who generally have low incomes. Uh, and because the $1,200 check everyone got uh, below a certain level of income. And then you notice that, uh, so that's one part of the story. That's why people with low incomes have seen their 
their spending actually go up until about the end of August. And then there's a drop. And the reason for that drop, of course, is that the supplemental unemployment insurance ended. And uh, we're, the state is losing, uh, I think about a billion dollars a week in spending as a result of the end of the supplemental unemployment insurance. Um, that plus the fact that as we've seen, there's very high unemployment rates from people with low incomes. People with high incomes that spending is still below where it would be and, and certainly far below where it would be if we had a normal economic growth. And the explanation there is something important to notice if you want to understand what's happening in our economy. Um, people with high incomes uh, have a lot more disposable income. Uh, that means they have a lot, they have a lot more options and, and many of those options have been taken away by COVID-19. People are not, as I said, not going out to dinner. They're not going to the movies. Their theaters are closed. They're not going to theater, not going to sports events. They're not taking trips, uh, not getting on airplanes by and large, not staying in hotels. Um, partly because of uncertainty about the economy. They're not, they're not spending heavily uh, for things that aren't really necessary. And, and while, you know, no, I don't feel bad for folks who are saving money because they can't go out to dinner. It's not the worst thing in the world. In terms of the economy as a whole, it's a problem because a, a lot of people with higher incomes have a lot more to spend. And if they're spending less, that's dragging down the economy as a whole. And, and that's something uh, for, to pay attention to. Um, we, we've, and as we see the economy decline again, uh, particularly uh, because of the lack of funding for those with low incomes, the lack of, because this unemployment uh, supplements ending, we're gonna see uh, uh, greater economic distress for everyone. And that may even lead people with higher incomes who are, have not suffering unemployment uh, to the same extent and who have money coming in, maybe dropping their spending just because of uncertainty about the, the economy. Um, Small business revenue remains 12% before it, it was. And I left it where about 18% of small businesses are still closed. That's what we see. Here's the, the change in small business revenue. You see for all of them, it's about 12%, 0.6% under the, uh, where it was in January. And again, there's variation. Some small businesses have, have recovered. Education and health services have, have not to the same extent. People aren't going to the doctors as often, not going to hospitals. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, optional health services are not being delivered. And then you can see the huge decline in the hospitality and leisure industry. Um, and the number of small businesses that are open is 18% below um, where it was in January 20th. Uh, there's no question small businesses were very much hurt by, by COVID-19 and the economic crash it created. Uh, <laughs> One other thing to pay attention to is we have a housing crisis that's coming our way. Um, this is data from the Census Pulse Survey, which ran from beginning of May through about the end of July. It shows the percentage of adults who are behind on their rent. Uh, and it's been about 20% consistently. And that means as we get to the current period, that doesn't just mean 20% of people are behind on the rent because if, if any one week, 20% of renters are behind, that means over two month period, maybe 30 to 40% of renters ha have some overdue rent. And that means that when, when the moratorium ends and we have a partial moratorium thanks to the CDC, uh, when that moratorium ends, a lot of renters are, are potentially going to be uh, unable to, to uh, pay their current rent or their back rent that they owe, and they will face potential eviction. The chart on the table on the right shows how people were paying rent for those who were. And you notice uh, only 31% were using regular income sources. 34% um, were using uh, unemployment insurance. Lots of people were borrowing from friends, selling assets, um, using uh, other kinds of sources of income that frankly don't get you very far because at a point they run out. And that's why we think there's a, a great potential for uh, people are to be at risk for losing their rental home statewide. We estimate that when a moratorium ends, somewhere between 355 and 710,000 households will be behind on their rent. Uh, those households have between 881 and one point, sorry, I left out a dash there. It should be 881, 449,000 to 
1.7 million people um, will be uh, subject to losing uh, to eviction. And that's a very, very serious problem that's been created by COVID-19. Uh, now, I want to say a little bit more about why this all happened. Because if you pay attention to what the Republicans have been saying in Harrisburg and to what President Trump has been saying, um, they've been blaming the damaged economy on government shutdown orders. And that's simply not true. And if you just stop and think about it for 10 seconds, you know, it will be clear that it's, it's simply not true. Although, you know, there's this old saying that thinking is hard in 10 seconds is a long time. So maybe not surprising that not everyone has figured this out. Um, people were re quite reasonably scared of getting sick themselves, or maybe even more importantly, passing on the virus to others. And if there had been no government shutdown order, um, then we would still have seen an economic decline. And if we had, and if they were scared, given what happened with the shutdown order, if there were no shutdown order, I'm sure there would be some more business activity, but by the same token, there'd be more people getting sick, and thus people would have would have then decided, hey, we shouldn't we shouldn't be going out. We should be protecting ourselves. Now, here's the evidence for that. One piece of evidence is the experience of Sweden. You may have heard Sweden did not order business closures or social distancing, and yet Sweden's economy dropped by 8.6 percent in the second quarter, uh, a little bit better than the U.S., which dropped to 9.5 to percent. But their mortality rate was much more serious, and another six per 100,000 people. But the even better com uh, comparison is Denmark. Denmark's a country very much like Sweden in terms of demographics. Denmark was very aggressive in shutting down its economy and closing businesses and insisting on social distancing. And you note that their decline was, uh, was still bad, but not nearly as bad as Sweden's. And their mortality rate was was one, almost one-sixth of Sweden's. So uh, why do they have better economic res results despite doing you know, business closures and social distancing? Because they got COVID-19 under control. Sweden did not get it under control and people stayed, stayed home. You know, it's sort of this, you know that uh, Yogi Berra line, places are so busy that no one goes there anymore. Well, places would be so infected with COVID-19 that no one would go in there anymore. That's what happened in Sweden. They suffered an economic decline. Uh, Denmark didn't, which shows you that that the whole narrative about we had to choose between health and our uh, uh, and economic uh, uh, growth was a false narrative. The truth is, the the better way to have restored our economy quicker would have been to take really aggressive steps in getting COVID nineteen under control, requiring everyone to wear masks keeping businesses closed until things were starting to recover and then reopening. And there's other evidence that, that supports the same idea. If you look at where unemployment rates were high and COVID-19 were high in Pennsylvania um, through August 31st, you find that they, they parallel one another. Unemployment was much higher in Southeastern Pennsylvania than in rural uh, Pennsylvania. And that's typically not what's found in uh, recessions in this state. What's typically found in recessions in the state, it's the rural areas that get hit the hardest because they're the economically weakest parts of the state. But here's where COVID-19 was found. And here's where uh, unemployment rate was high. Unemployment rate is highest in Southeast PA and parts of Southwest PA where the COVID-19 virus was, was worse. We did a, a, what's called a correlation analysis. There was a 33% correlation between unemployment and COVID-19. Again, that shows that the reason we had economic decline was COVID-19, not just business closures. Here's some more evidence. We, did, we looked at a lot of survey research. Um, even after the first wave, this IPSO service is from late May, people were unwilling to go to sporting events, go to the movie theater, go to church, fly an airplane, go to a gym. Um, why? Because they didn't want to get sick. Uh, if, if, and this was again, after the first wave was declining, if we had stayed at a higher rate of COVID spreading, then people would have been even more reluctant to, to go take part in these activities or go just into, into small shops. So again, the evidence seems to be that uh, COVID-19 itself is what undermined the economy, not just the, the business closure disorders. Other evidence, the spike in cases in Southern and Southwestern states that opened prematurely led to a second drop in economic activity in those states. 
And finally, go back to something I pointed out earlier. Consumer spending among those with high incomes dropped further than among those with low incomes. Why? Because uh, people with high incomes have, a, you know, are not spending their additional dollars on, on necessities. They, they have an option to spend. And they didn't go out and spend on, because they were afraid. Even if they could have, they wouldn't have gone out to spend. And they're still not going out to spend at things that are optional for them because they're afraid of getting sick or they're afraid of making other people sick. And one of the really sad things about the whole right-wing narrative about COVID-19 is they say, oh, you know, if you're scared of getting sick, you should wear a mask or you should stay home, but don't tell us anyone else to do that. What that seems to forget is something the right-wing always forgets. And that is our actions have consequences for other people. Um, I've been staying at home and I've been protecting myself, not because I'm really afraid of getting COVID-19, although I probably should be more afraid than I am given my age, but because my mother-in-law is, uh, is 93 years old and is in a, uh, a home, we visit her, I don't want to get her sick. I don't, and that's really our main concern. And that's what a lot of people's concern are. And that's the kind of concern that seems very hard for some folks on the right, including President Trump to understand. Hey, Mark, now, the, yes. Mark yes. Very, very quickly, we've gotten a couple questions here. I'm not gonna go to all of them now, but there's one that's okay. kind of related to what you were just going over. It's a question from uh, James wondering, is the entertainment field, meaning film, television, live events, theater, sports, included in the leisure numbers that you cited earlier? Uh, I believe so, yes. Okay, thanks, just, you can continue. We'll go to the other questions when you wrap up. Yeah, I'm part, I've been looking to see where the, uh, I, I can't see the chat. Oh, here it is, it must be. When, when, you, when you share your screen, things move around. Okay, I got it, so I can, I can track that too. Okay, so there's a lot we still don't know about um, the economic impact of COVID-19. We don't know if there's going to be another spike. Uh, it's quite possible as the weather gets bad um, and, we, and we stay more indoors, there will be further spikes and, and, and that will have an economic impact. We don't know how fast consumer recovery will, spending will keep recovering. Um, a lot of families, uh, you know, may be digging themselves out of the holes. They may be worried about spending at previous levels. And of course, as Jeff pointed out, federal support is very uncertain. Uh, I, I agree with Jeff, it's no longer likely under a Trump presidency, which means whether we're gonna get federal relief for uh, supplemental unemployment insurance, relief for state and local governments, more money for Medicaid, more money for housing, really depends on what happens in November 11th, November 3rd, not just in the presidency, but in the United States Senate as well. Uh, and I'll be talking a little bit about why it's so important that we actually do get that relief. So, um, Here's a little bit of an overview. Um, uh, burden of economic crisis is found mainly on those with low incomes or disproportionately people of color. The crisis is getting worse as the unemployment insurance payments has ended. Inequality, which was already high, is going to get worse, particularly with regard to wealth, as uh, people uh, who are, have higher incomes are saving their money, getting wealthier. We've seen that people who own businesses that have done very well like Jeff Bezos at Amazon have seen their wealth skyrocket. Um, and I, one thing I would say, and it's a point I'm gonna keep making, economic recovery is gonna be impossible, especially for small businesses without sustained increases in consumption. And the only people who are likely to do that uh, increase in consumption are those with low and moderate incomes. If we can get them uh, the, the, the political support they need to see their incomes go up. And that means raising the minimum wage and means uh, adding to adding on to unemployment insurance again. Uh, and then we have to help small businesses. There's no way most small businesses are going to survive unless they get a lot of direct help. And uh, we've seen in Pennsylvania had a small program to help small businesses with the CARES Act money. It, it, we, had, we passed, uh, you know, $100 million once and I think $60 million and 125 roughly in that ballpark. And the money was gone in, in a day and a half. Our small businesses are really hurting and they need, need help or, or they, many of them are gonna disappear. Now let's look at the Pennsylvania budget. Um, uh, and first I'm gonna talk about some of the context of it give you a little background information. And then we're gonna look at the current, current circumstance. Um, first, uh, this was the governor's proposed budget. Uh, 
back in February. He proposed a budget of $36.1 million, billion dollars, sorry, in the general fund. Um, we thought that the governor's proposal was already insufficient at that time. And you may, if you have been to any of our budget presentations, you've seen this chart before. We've seen a decline in general fund expenditure and revenues as a share uh, of gross state product since 2012. Um, it, it's almost a, a now about a 12% decline because, uh, because frankly, the governor's, Governor Walsh has proposed new spending and the General Assembly simply keeps saying no. Um, and, and one consequence of this decline in state spending, which was never ter terribly high to begin with, is that we suffer and have suffered from a serious public investment deficit. Many of you heard me say this stuff before, so I'm just gonna review it quickly. We have the most unequal K-12 school funding in America, both in terms of income and race. Our pre-K funding lags behind neighboring states. Higher education funding is fourth from the bottom of, among all states on a per capita basis. The only thing uh, Pennsylvania leads in is student debt, which is among the highest in the country. Spending on environmental protection is below that of what it was 20 years ago. Our roads and bridges are in a serious state of disrepair. And while it's not part of the budget, I'd say, or I should add, we haven't raised the minimum wage in 13 years in the state, 10 years, including the federal level. Um, that's a serious, serious problem that we already had in the state before COVID-19. Our budget is, has been tight, has been uh, spending too little, and frankly, we've been raising too little revenues to, to cover our real needs. Um, and the needs of Pennsylvanians are gonna get greater. We've already talked about the housing crisis. We talked about small businesses desperately needing support. School needs more support to provide online instruction. Uh, our schools are, are losing about one to $2 billion is the latest estimate in local revenues, which means they're gonna have to make it up with by raising local property taxes or by drastically cutting school spending, which is already not very high in much of the state. And the, our, our public schools are losing about $300 million a year now to cyber charters because people are leaving the public schools to, to go to the cyber charters, which are, and this is a whole other subject, grossly overfunded on a per student basis, but uh, are getting more students to, to come to them because uh, their experience in providing online education. Uh, we have a real problem with access to health care that needs to be expanded. The Medicaid caseload may rise further. Our health in care institutions have been suffering. Now we did use a lot of the CARES uh, money to support them, but they will need more um, because of COVID-19. Uh, many hospitals could not do the, the elective procedures that they usually do, and those are things they make money on. Uh, you see some right-wing uh, fantasies about how, yeah, the goal of COVID-19 was to help hospitals uh, get rich because of all the health care they're providing. Hospitals are losing money on COVID-19 care. Uh, the money is in procedures. The money is not in watching people uh, die and giving them uh, you know, end-of-life care. And of course, income support needs to be maintained for those who are unemployed and, for, and those wages need to rise. So we have a budget that is already too tight that had created a serious public investment deficit in the state. And now because of COVID-19, um, I think we're more aware of the inequality that some of us have known for a long time, but we have a lot of new needs that have to be met uh, if, if our people are gonna to be able to get through this crisis in a decent state. Um, and yet, um, and, and it, the problem, these needs are, are just not about uh, justice, although that's the first uh, issue. It's also about recovery. Uh, the fact is we're not gonna have a recovery in Pennsylvania of our economy unless it's a just, just recovery. Consumer spending is 70% of the US economy. We saw that despite uh, not losing jobs, those with high incomes, continue to spend at levels below pre-recession level, the pre-recession point. Um, a sustained economic recovery thus depends on increased spending from those with low and moderate incomes. And even that won't save small businesses unless we give them direct support. So we're gonna, it's gonna take state support for people uh, with low incomes and state support for businesses to get us out of a, a, a very serious economic crisis. So the needs uh, for state spending and for uh, uh, expanded government are greater than ever because of COVID-19. But where's the current 
where's the Pennsylvania budget? Now, as you know, excuse me, just one second. I can turn off my printer for a second. My wife seems to be printing things. Um, we enacted a, 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 a stopgap budget in, in the middle of June, a budget of $25.7 billion. Remember the governor's proposal was 36 billion. And by the way, there's a, the, what we call the cost to carry budget is the, the, what it would really cost to do this year, what we did last year, would be a little less than the governor proposed. Governor's budget was very, very austere. So uh, we had a $25.7 billion budget. It flat funded 5 12th of state expenditures at last year's levels. And remember, because of inflation, uh, even though inflation is low, that still means that there's a, a, a slight cut in the real impact of government spending. And it flat funds K-12 education, higher education, um, the school, teachers employment, uh, retirement fund and debt service uh, for 12 months. Uh, so uh, at the funding for seven, for about, you know, a third of the budget um, runs out at the end of November. And that's the situation we have to deal with right now. Uh, the, um, I was going to talk about CARES Act allocations, I, and I've talked about that with you all before, so I'm not going to, I decided to, to not do it and, and uh, left the slide in, sorry. Uh, I'll, uh, for those of you who didn't hear the earlier presentation, when we send out the slide deck, I'll, I'll get that, I'll, I'll fill that information in. So we, we have uh, about $10 billion more to appropriate, and yet we have very, very serious state revenue losses. Um, Depending on who you talk to, the IFO estimates about, it's between four and $5.3 billion. The IFO estimates, it'll be about 4 billion. Uh, the Department of Revenue estimates about 5.3 billion. And that's a two year revenue loss over 1920. And I'm sorry, I should have written 2020, 21 on that second bullet. Um, now, some people have been a little optimistic in the, the last couple of months because revenues are coming in higher than projections. Uh, two things to keep in mind. One is the higher revenues in June and July were the result of the state allowing people to pay their income taxes late. Second, um, the higher revenues are compared to the, to, to the new low projections, uh, the post COVID-19 projections. So um, it's, it's somewhat good news that they're coming in higher, but they're certainly not coming in higher enough to reduce the, four to $5.3 billion uh, revenue shortfall by very much. And then we have the, the extraordinary failure of the federal government to keep uh, funding state and local governments, um, which will lead to slow economic growth. We heard the, the chairman of the Federal uh, Reserve say that just yesterday. You hear it from every economist who, who has any good record of predicting the, the future. Um, our economy got recovered uh, between um, May and the uh, and September, precisely because of the huge federal outlays that that uh, have been going to the states and through the CARES Act, that have been going to people through uh, supplemental uninsurance, unemployment insurance, and through the the addition the twelve hundred dollar checks that so many people got. Um, Without that continued stimulus, we can expect the economy to decline again. And the longer we wait to have that additional economic stimulus, the, the, the longer we're going to see that economic decline. So it's quite possible that the failure of the Trump administration and Congress to reach an agreement on, on uh, uh, and we, I, just to be clear, it's the Senate Republicans that are blocking it, not all of Congress. The House of Representatives passed a bill uh, with Democratic support only uh, months ago for $3 trillion in spending. That failure is going to lead to further economic decline and could make our estimate of state revenue losses even greater. Um, and by the way, it's not just a one year prob problem. Uh, in sep September, the Department of Revenue gave some projections for state revenues over the next uh, two years. Um, and on the left is their, their estimates from uh, March of 2020 when the governor's, uh, governor's proposal, budget proposal came out. And the right is their estimates of uh, September 2020. 
So we're in 2021 and they're, they're estimating at that time about a $6 billion decline. Uh, even for the next year, 2122, the year begins the July 21st, 2021, they're expecting an almost $3 billion revenue shortfall. Uh, we're, this economic crisis is gonna continue for a long time. And that means we're gonna have revenue shortfalls for at least through the end of 2020, uh, probably through the end of 2021 and even beyond. Uh, just to give you an idea of how big $4 billion is, uh, what does that look like? Well, that's 40% of what we spend on pre-K on, uh, pre education. Uh, it's, that's pre-K to 12 education, sorry. It's 80% of all basic education funding. It's 15 times what we spend on pre-K. It's more than three times what we spend on higher education. If it's 50 times what we spend on workforce training. It's 70% of what we spend on medical assistance and long-term care. And medical assistance is what we call Medicaid in Pennsylvania. And it's two and a half times what we spend on care for those who are intellectually disabled. This is a big, big number. Remember this general fund budget is 36, the governor proposed was $36 billion. We're talking about a $5 billion shortfall on that budget. That's huge. Um, so what are the options for closing the revenue gap? Uh, well, one is new federal funds. Um, the question is, when is it gonna come? Clearly it depends on, on the election results. Um, if, if Republicans still control the Senate, we, they're gonna be resistant to any, any federal bailouts of the states. If Donald Trump is elected, I suspect he will be resistant. Uh, if Joe Biden is elected and um, we have a Democratic Senate, I would expect we, the federal spigots will open, but that won't happen until uh, January 20th. So we're gonna have to get through some very, very tough months. And uh, I just point, want to remind myself to, that the, to tell you that the, what Trump and McConnell are saying about why they oppose uh, bailouts for the states is just a, a pack of lies. You know, what they're basically saying is, we don't want to help states that have created an economic crisis in their or, or state budget crisis because they're spending too much money or because uh, their, their pensions are out of control. Number one, that, I mean, that's not true generally in the country as a whole, and it's absolutely not true in, in Pennsylvania. As you've seen, spending has been declining in the state as a share of GDP. Uh, we've basically fixed our pension problem over the last four years, we've been paying what we should every year, and the, the pension uh, the deficit is, is set to expire in the late 2020s. And by the way, it has not, the pension uh, gap has nothing to do with the, the, the annual budget gap. So the, the fact is they're just making up lies about this as about so many other things to justify a totally unconscionable disregard for the very serious needs of not just Pennsylvania, but most of the states in the country as a result of their failure to, to deal with the COVID-19 epidemic. So federal funds is one option. A second option is deep budget cuts. Now, the fact is there's very little to cut as the budgets are steer and much of it can't be cut. Now, we, if you take into account mandated expenditures, things we have to pay, debt service, pensions, federal state programs that if we cut uh, will uh, will re require that we give up substantial federal funds like medical assistance, Medicaid. It's very hard to cut. Public safety, we can't just open up the prisons. Many of us would like to do that, but you know that's not going to happen. And, you know, there's some people who probably belong in there and we're not going to let them out. Basic operations of government, um, you, you, they may not deserve it given, given what they do, but the legislators are not going to work for nothing. Um, uh, there's just, you know, you, a $5 billion hole in a budget is something that's just very, very hard to cut because of so much the state does that, that it, it is really out of anyone's control. So where would you get the money? Well, human services cuts could happen again the way they did under Governor Corbett, but they would be devastating and they would still not come close to meeting the needs. Outside of Medicaid, uh, we, human service spending is not very high. You could cut almost everything and only save 400 billion, 500 billion, 500 million dollars a year, less than, you know, 500 million out of the $5 billion deficit. So what they'd have to do is go back to education funding and cut uh, the funding of education as they did in, in, in uh, 2011. 
Uh, that's the only place there's real serious uh, room to cut the budget heavily. That would be mean reopening the decision they made in June to fully fund uh, uh, the basic education funding and other K to 12 and also higher education funding at, at last year's levels. Um, so that's possible. And I, I'm sure I, I have heard Republicans talking about it in Harrisburg. But one thing to keep in mind about all these deep budget cuts is that they would very much undermine economic recovery in Pennsylvania. We know that for a fact, because when Governor Corbett slashed education funding by a billion dollars and higher education funding by $300 million and human service spending by three to $400 million, we saw slow economic recovery in, in this state. Because when you cut state spending, you cut jobs. We lost 27,000 jobs in K to 12 schools and I don't know how many jobs additionally because of the other corporate cuts. Those people lose their jobs. They can't spend um, what they're used to spending. It, it leads to an economic decline. And Pennsylvania wasn't the only case that did that. You know, the story of Louisiana and Kansas did what Tom Corbett did, but, but on steroids, and they created a total economic disasters in their states. So deep budget cuts, not only unjust and unfair to our kids, to people who need human services, but it would lead to slow economic decline, uh, slow economic recovery at a time when economic recovery is already going to be very slow. So it, it really isn't a serious option, although I know people are talking about it in Harrisburg uh, on the Republican side. Third option is borrowing. Uh, you know, we have a constitutional barrier on, on borrowing money for operating costs. The barrier is kind of flimsy. Uh, as, I, as I once said, you know, what's a constitution among friends? Two years ago, uh, we ran a $1.5 billion deficit in the state because the General Assembly did not appropriate enough money for, for the year and for the, what uh, didn't, uh, did, sorry, they, they didn't raise enough revenues for what they appropriated. And we borrowed, we securitized tobacco revenues, we sold bonds on the basis of paying the back with tobacco revenues and we, and we could do it again. There's a potential for getting federal loans. The Federal Reserve has tried to be helpful. I don't think anyone believes that what they're offering now uh, is long enough term to really help the states. Although under a new administration um, encouraging them, the Federal Reserve might offer very long-term low interest rate loans to states to help them deal with the budget crisis. But again, that won't happen till January 20th. We could securitize revenue streams. About half the tobacco revenues have been securitized. The liquor control board revenues haven't been securitized and can be, uh, and that can be done just on the governor's say so. We don't need the General Assembly to approve it. Um, I think this is a good idea. Um, the rationale for borrowing is the same rationale for borrowing that we use in times of war. We're fighting a war that's not just gonna help people today, but help people over the long term. It's a long term effort to secure the fu economic future of our country and to help the people in this country get over a terrible crisis and, and, and come out of it somewhat whole. Uh, there's no reason that we should all bear the burden this year of dealing with this long-term crisis, just as we shouldn't have, the people in 1943 shouldn't have paid all the cost of World War II. And we, are, we didn't stop paying back the cost of World War II till well into the 1970s. So uh, I think borrowing makes sense, but it has a problem. And that is every time you borrow on, on revenue streams, you cannibalize future revenues. If the tobacco revenues or liquor control board revenues are going back to pay bonds, they're not available to pay the operating costs. So at some point, you, you, we, although you get over a hump, you create a problem for future year budgets. Um, fourth issue is raising revenues. Now, I know many people say you shouldn't raise revenues in a recession, and that's not really true. You shouldn't raise taxes in a recession. Um, if the funds are spent, be, uh, the, the theory is you raise taxes, people have less money to spend, and that hurts the economy. But, and that's true, but only if you raise taxes and spend the money. If you spend the money, then the money's still being spent, whether by individuals or by, by uh, the government. And if you tax rich people who, as we have seen, are not spending all their income now because there's nothing for them to spend it on, you are actually will create an economic, more of an economic recovery by taxing them and having the government spend them. So what we should be doing is making our tax system fair, taxing people who are not spending the incomes they have and have been paying less than their fair share and reducing taxes on those who need help have been paying more than their fair share. And 
if you want to know who's been paying their fair share and who hasn't, let's come back to my favorite chart. Um, the lowest 20% of Pennsylvanians pay 13.8% of their uh, income in taxes, state and local taxes, and the top 1% of Pennsylvanians, people who average, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do, do that. Uh, people who make uh, uh, an average of $1.7 million a year only pay 6% of their income uh, in state and local taxes. We've had a very unfair tax system. It's time to make it fair and to raise revenues to pay for, for the, the state budget at a time when there's so many demands on the state budget and we're $5 billion short in revenues. Uh, I'm not gonna go into detail on the fair share tax, uh, but uh, we've talked about this many times with you. It's a way to, to reduce taxes on, on low income people while raising tax on the rich. It would raise 2.3 to $2.5 billion at the rates we proposed before. And we could have much higher rates. Um, we could close corporate tax loopholes, the Delaware and the Cayman Island loopholes. And depending on where the corporate tax rate would set, that would raise 300 to $6 million. We could uh, legalize recreational cannabis and raise somewhere between 250 and $500 million over a year or so. Um, finally, let me just say a word about timing. Um, what's going to happen in November 30th is not a traditional budget impasse. Uh, uh, during a traditional budget impasse, no budget's passed, but health and safety spending continues and state employees keep getting paid during an impasse. The only people who are not paid are government contractors and the schools. If you remember the long impasse, uh, we had about a nine month impasse, uh, 2016. The um, uh, schools were okay until almost till March. The people who were getting hurt were the social service providers who, who need government funding. Um, but state employees were still getting paid. Much, most of the government was continuing, even though we didn't have a budget. This is not that situation because we did pass a budget, but only with enough appropriations to pay for five twelfths of the year for about a third of the line items. And there's nowhere in that, in that um, appropriation bill that says, oh, this is only a five month budget. It's a budget. And because it's a budget, uh, most people think that uh, there's a lot of questions about what the government can keep spending once the appropriations run out. So here's, here's what it looks like. Any line item funded for 12 months, government can keep spending at November 30th. Line items for which the five month appropriation has not all been spent can keep spending until that appropriation ends. But once it ends, they can't spend anymore. Line items necessary for health and safety can, can still, be, can still can continue to be spent out of. That includes prisons, state police. We don't know what else it includes. And there, there could be some legal disputes. Does it include county assistant offices that are providing help to folks with low income, including help getting health care? Um, we don't actually know for sure. Uh, so there's a lot of uncertainty, but it looks like we could have a major crisis November 30th unless we do something. And there's also potential for a cash flow crisis that the state would simply run out of cash. Although what I'm hearing in the last week or so is that it could probably be managed by the treasury through the end of the fiscal year in June 30th, although whether we have enough money to, to pay back what the treasury is going to borrow to, to avoid the cash flow crisis isn't clear. So what, uh, I skipped something. Oh, I think I left out a chart. So what are the options? Um, one option is uh, the Republicans play hardball in November and the governor is forced to compromise with them and we see something like a Corbett budget. Uh, we see deep cuts to education funding, human services funding, probably some borrowing because those two, those two cuts aren't enough. Uh, and and it frankly is a disaster for the people of Pennsylvania and for the economy of Pennsylvania. That's one option. Second option is they punt and do a three more month stopgap budget through January, uh, probably paying for it with some borrowing. Uh, and then we hope that uh, the election goes the right way and we have a, uh, well, by then we will know whether the election goes the right way. And when the Democratic president takes control in January 20th, we get the federal funds we need. Um, and then the third option is chaos and a budget impasse. Um, 
and I've had conversations with four or five people who are uh, work in either the administration or the state senate and state house over the last three weeks, and that word chaos keeps coming up. Usually, um, you know, a month or two before budget decision has to be made, people have a rough idea of what might happen. At this point, no one has any idea what's going to happen. So much of it depends on the election. And those three options I told you of, a, of a, basically a Republican budget punting for three months and then solving the problem with a lot of federal funds and a democratic priorities, uh, a democratically controlled general assembly, which might raise taxes uh, is, and chaos. And which of those happens depends very much on what happens November 3rd. And frankly, not just for the Pennsylvania budget, for, but for this uh, state country as a whole. So that's what I've got. I'm sorry I've gone on for a, a little long, but um, there's, it's a it's a very difficult story, and I wanted you to have the the, the real background you needed to to understand uh, the crisis we're in because it is a very very serious crisis. Sure, Mark. Thanks um, for folks who are able to hang on the line with us. Here we have a handful of questions that I think we can probably address fairly quickly. Um, I'm going to go first to Perry Jude. A few of these questions, Mark, are related to uh, housing issues. And Perry mm -hmm. Jude has a question uh, related to, to uh, the CDC moratorium. Go ahead, Perry Jude. Hi, Mark. Uh, thanks for the, uh, the terrific presentation, as sad as it is. Uh, so have you gotten any information or have been included any information about the CDC moratorium? how it is or isn't working in Pennsylvania as it contributes to the housing crisis? Um, the word I have is that it's helping, but it's not enough because it's not clear whether the CDC moratorium includes people whose leases have run out. And a lot of people typically have month to month leases or, or, or rely on a month to month lease after their term ends. And um, we would love to see the Pennsylvania courts interpret uh, the CDC moratorium is requiring that folks in that circumstance uh, are protected from eviction. So far, they haven't done that, and, and there's a real problem. Okay. There's also a real problem because the, the rental the rent subsidy program um, expired. The government extended it by, by executive order, but it's uh, it, it has to be fixed because it's of the $150 million that's been uh, appropriated out of CARES Act money, only about 10 million has been spent because the program has a lot of serious issues. Okay. Sure. Thanks for your question. We're going to go to another question here from Nicole. Uh, this one is kind of related to the impact of uh, people's credit scores being damaged and how that might impact the, uh, the housing market in the future. Nicole, you're going to need to unmute on your end. Okay, there you go. Go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for um, these presentations are so informative. I really, um, it's, well, it's quite frightening as well. But I was wondering, um, what have we done to stop like the, the damage that's doing, being done to crit scores and the effect it's gonna have going forward for years and years and years? I mean, what can we do on a state level or federal level there to, I don't know, I was a big proponent of like pause PA when this first started, like just stop everything and get through it. And I wanna know how we are gonna move from that in that area, if we gave all these banks, these, you know, this help, why aren't they stopping the reporting? That's actually a very, very good issue, a question and an issue we should, we should address. I haven't really thought much about it. Um, I have noticed something really sad that bugs me is that there's another case in which people who are, who are well off, they're doing okay during this recession because they're refinancing their homes at incredibly low interest rates and saving tons of money. And people on the other hand with low incomes are facing evictions and, and uh, losing their homes because they can't pay their mortgage. So yeah, I, I think um, that's something, it probably has to be addressed at the federal level, but maybe state banking regulations could do that where, where they, we uh, tell banks and that they simply have to not take into account the uh, the credits what credit experience during the COVID nineteen crisis because people are are suffering for for reasons that have nothing to do with their own probity. Very good point. We'll look into that some more. Thank you. Thank you for the question. 
we're going to take a question now from Jonathan Paul. Go ahead. Hello, everybody from Hi. somewhere in the undisclosed Lancaster, Pennsylvania location. My question had to do with all the news flying by. I did at least get a headline that Governor Wolf was going to initiate another rent eviction moratorium. Anyone have the update on that? And thank you. Uh, I have not heard. We've been asking him to uh, take action and to, to um, basically build on the CDC moratorium to, to uh, uh, help protect everyone who is not necessarily protected in part because of the way that moratorium is interpreted. I haven't heard that, that he's going to do that. I hope that's, that's true. But at this point, the last time we met with the administration on this issue, and, um, they said they, they thought their hands were tied by, by law. Well, let's pursue that, please. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Yep. Thanks, Jonathan Paul, from the undisclosed location in Lancaster. We're going to take a question now from James. Uh, James, you'll need to unmute on your end, and I think you can go ahead. Hey, how's it going? Um, so the 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 <clears throat> excuse me, the budget uh, questions you're discussing all coincide with the end of the money availability for PMAP and rental relief and the movement of that back to Harrisburg. It's supposed to move out to the counties. Is there a chance that that's going to get interrupted because of this? Are you you're talking about the, the rental assistance program and mortgage assistance program? Yeah. Yeah, well, that program officially ended uh, at the end of September. Governor has extended it through, uh, I, I'm not sure through when, uh, by executive order. November. The problem, yeah, the problem is uh, until the General Assembly fixes the program, um, people aren't going to be able to take advantage of it. Just to give you one idea of one of the problems is there's a 700 there's a, a limit on how much a, a landlord can charge if they accept this program. So they can't charge more than $750 a month, which is much lower than what most rent is in most parts of the state. So landlords haven't been accepting it. Now, I just heard uh, this morning, and I haven't even had a chance to read my emails about it, that the governor thinks that they, he can fix some of this program through executive order. Um, and some fixes we still have to wait for the General Assembly. Um, so maybe, maybe, maybe we'll get some progress because there's still, there's, there's $140 million or so appropriated that hasn't been spent because the program was just broken. Um, I hope he's gonna fix it. And if he doesn't, I hope the General Assembly does. Great. And I gotta, I gotta say, there's been incredible activism on the part of many of our We The People partners, 1PA, Pittsburgh United, CASA, Make the Road, They've been working so hard on this issue, contacting people, talking with me, went to the governor's office. So um, hopefully that's gonna have some impact on both the General Assembly and the governor. My, my question though has to do with the, un, the unused funds from that program go back mm -hmm. to the state on November 30th. Um, and then from there, it's currently scheduled to be redistributed to the counties. I don't know what the formula is they're gonna to use to redistribute it. Would, would the legislature have the chance to deny that redistribution uh, if this budget isn't fixed by then? Uh, yes, I mean, they, they, they can handle it through a separate appropriation. Uh, the, uh, the uh, that money come, came from the CARES Act, and it was a separate appropriation from the CARES Act, so they can they don't have to fix the whole budget problem to, to fix this one. Thanks for the question. Uh, we're going to go up to Northwestern Pennsylvania. Um, question here coming from uh, Freda. Go ahead. And yeah, I think you need to unmute the line on your end. Okay. There you go. Hi there. Um, whether or not we agree with the idea of fracking, uh, the governor and many of our candidates up and down the ballot and, and our legislatures do support fracking. Mm -hmm. So as far as revenue sources, wh what is the potential for the severance tax to advance? Depends on November 3rd. Um, if, if one of those General Assembly chambers flipped the Democrats, I, I think we will see a severance tax. 
uh, and I actually meant to put it in the in the my list of good taxes and and forgot. Uh, frankly, one problem though is it's not going to raise as much money now as it would have had we done it five or six years ago because gas prices are so low, and as long as uh, the we're in this economic uh, uh, crash, uh, they're probably going to re remain low. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. I mean, uh, at some point, I'd love to see fracking banned, but as long as we have it, we ought to be getting the revenues from it that every other state is getting. So again, it, it, all, de it all depends on politics. Uh, I don't see it happening as long as the Republicans are in charge of the House of Representatives in Pennsylvania. Thank you for the question. We're going to take one last question. Thanks for those who wanted to stay on the line here with us. Um, our final question comes from uh, Bucks County. We're going to go to Noni for that question. Noni, you can Hi, unmute your line on your end and ask. Hi, Hi Noni. Hi. So my question is, is the Appropriations Committee going to do um, a, a budget review and hold uh, hearings so, because they have to go in and, and redo the budget, I would imagine, for the rest of the year. So are mm -hmm. they going to be doing um, hearings like they do when they come into the full year budget, which would help us with transparency? I very much doubt it just because um, they'll be, they, they're they not going to make any decisions till after the election and they have a November 30th deadline. Uh, I, I think what we will see is uh, not a compressed budget process as a whole. We'll see a, uh, what we usually see in June. That is a lot of inside dealing and um, decision making behind closed doors. Um, so then we're going to have to call our legislators to find out what is happening. Yeah, I, I think it, you know, if you have particular areas of the budget that you're really concerned about, you should be talking to legislators now. Uh, we will be doing a bunch of advocacy. Um, after the election to, tr to, to try to get the best possible budget. Uh, how we do it depends in part on what happens during the election because um, what we're gonna ask for and what we're gonna hope for may, may depend on, 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 on how things uh, result. If say um, Democrats flip one house or both houses of the General Assembly, um, it's quite possible that the Republicans say, okay, we'll do something temporary and then you guys deal with it in January. Um, if they can, I, it's not clear there's enough revenues to actually get through another three months without doing something. But uh, I, I, what we keep hearing is that they're, they're not interested in solving the problem if, if they don't have responsibility. They can avoid the responsibility for it. Um, um, and so we'll, we may actually be happy with that. We might say, okay, we can go three more months. Let's see what we get from the federal government. Let's see you know, whether we can move the Democratic Party to support new tax revenues and the kinds of spending that, that we think we need to generate a just recovery and to help low-income people. Um, I, I think there's a lot of interest on the part of Democratic leaders to do that if they have the power to do it. And they might be willing to say, okay, we'll just do some temporary in November We'll come back in January, and then we'll really fill up our sleeves and and get a Pennsylvania a budget it deserves. But again, you know, it, it's hard to say right now. So come, you know, as soon as we know what happened politically, and that might not be on November fourth, it might be on November sixth or seventh. We will be very active in giving you all some guidance about what makes the most sense to get the kind of budget uh, we all want. Thank you. Thanks very much for that question, Noni, and thank you to all of you. We still have uh, uh, almost three dozen people still on the line. There uh, was a question about the video. We will be posting a video of this uh, online. We'll have it on YouTube. I'll send you the link for that. We will also send you a PDF of all of the slides that Mark presented, and we will continue to keep you posted on um, opportunities for advocacy for this federal relief in the weeks ahead, and also how you can take action to have the kind of state budget that Pennsylvania really needs. I wanna thank my colleague here and my boss, Mark Steer, for uh, an excellent presentation. Thank all of you for uh, tremendous questions and for all the attention that folks are paying to this issue. Um, gonna be a pretty hectic ride over the next few weeks, uh, kind of a roller coaster in uh, 
a lot of ways. So everyone hang in there and thanks so much for all you do to advocate. I'm going to unmute everybody's lines so that if folks want to uh, say goodbye as we uh, wrap up, we can do that. Um, and I think I have just unmuted everybody. So thanks so much, everyone. Have a great afternoon. You can say goodbye if you'd like to. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you for being here. Thank you Take very care. much. Great job. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. Goodbye. Bye bye. Hi, Mark. I'll see you at 315. I'll see you soon.